The story of Upbuild began in a monastery. On our quest to understand ourselves more deeply, we recognize that it is our attachment to our egos, our identities, that gets in the way of being our true selves. This podcast will help you understand your ego. It will help you better understand your inner world, the motivations, insecurities, and emotions that affect your every action and relationship. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Hello, everyone. This is Michael Sloyer, and I am here with Razanath. Hello, Razanath. Hey, Michael. Good to see you again. <laughs> Great to be with you as always. Uh, we haven't recorded a podcast in a long time with just the two of us. So I've been really looking forward to getting back on the field with you. <laughs> that is true. Uh, I think probably since I went for paternity, I haven't really recorded a podcast. Today was two in a row. So <laughs> kind of two in a row up. podcasts and also two in a row girls. That you have. So you are the father of two daughters now. How does that feel? <laughs> it feels wonderful. And then with it comes uh, you're tested in all possible ways, as it would be with, I guess, any relationship that's close. Um, it's beautiful and it's testing. So, yeah, it's the same way. Of course, our second daughter right now is just so much easier because she's still not fully expressive. <laughs> she just smiles most of the time. <laughs> I think the topic here today is something that might actually be very relevant to parenting. <laughs> if not right now, maybe in a few years from now when you're experiencing potentially more of this emotion. And so our topic today is, is anger and looking at what is it, where does it come from, and what can we do about it? And one of the things that I've been thinking about, we recorded a podcast on anger last year called The Seduction of Anger. And one of the things that I've been thinking about in my own journey and also hearing about the journey of others is that even after working on my anger for so long, it still comes up. It's something intellectually, I, I'm very clear that this is not a healthy reaction most of the times when I'm experiencing it. And yet, even with all the self-work and even with the awareness, at least what I think is awareness around it, it's still something that presents an issue. And again, this is also something that I hear very often from my clients, the people that I work with, and, and just people more generally in my life. And so I was hoping we could get back on the field and have another conversation about this topic. Absolutely. Absolutely. As you were sharing that, I was just thinking that with so many of these emotions, like anger, shame, guilt, the best place to start would be to just understand our relationship with the emotion first. Because in our relationship with the emotion also lies a certain complexity of judgment of the emotion. So as you were talking about anger and feeling like anger is bad, that feeling sometimes also, and, the, and that feeling exists for a reason. That feeling also makes it hard to actually work through the emotion of anger. And we can talk about it more. It either leads to suppression, avoidance. And then on the other side, when we feel that anger, yeah, of course, I can be angry. <laughs> then it, it leads to the flip side of it, which is an outburst or like what you call the, the expression of rage. So in either case, it can be complex, but it'll be very helpful to understand why anger exists. Yeah, so let us start there. It was something that you and I had been briefly discussing before we started recording, and that was very striking. So please take us into that. Well, uh, to me, uh, every emotion is pointing to something. And Sometimes there are words associated with emotions like positive emotion or negative emotion. And again, understandable why. Uh, because when we talk about a negative emotion, it makes us uncomfortable. And many times the consequences of acting on those emotions also lead to greater suffering for others and for ourselves. So we term those emotions negative. But if you were to step back from putting a label on the emotion and just looking at the emotion itself. What is anger? And anger is uh, indicative 
that something has been violated. So if we were to think about the anatomy of the brain and talk about the amygdala, the, that part of the human brain that helps us survive, that part is extremely attentive to danger, to threat, to you know violation, essentially. It's an automatic response to violation, right? Fear and anger. <laughs> and they again, they're intertwined and interrelated. So anger arises because I feel at that moment that something has been violated. Now, at that moment, when we are angry, we don't know what has been violated. Sometimes we do. Most times we don't. <laughs> and there is also, because it's such a strong, anger is one emotion that's very, it's like there is almost like a concentrated experience to it. It just feels like all the force is in one place. Which, again, makes sense because when you're under attack, when something is violated, all resources need to be engaged in preventing the violation from happening or to respond to that violation. And this is such an important point because I think this is where the, what I was sharing earlier about, I want to fix this, I want to change this. But when when you're speaking about that surge coming in, that's where many of us experience helplessness as it relates to it, because in that moment, um, I'm I'm blanking out on who named this, but amygdala hijack. Your your amygdala is hijacked, and so you actually don't have the um, the capabilities to respond in an even keeled way at that point. It's true, and the reason why the amygdala functions the way it does is it's it's meant for auto response. It's meant for it's almost like, you know, it's a defense mechanism for the body. It's the first place that when something, when you feel threatened by something, even without consciously thinking about what you're responding to, your body responds to it, right? Because there is no time to think. <laughs> the amygdala is serving a function there, which is, I have to respond so quickly and if I take time to think, then I will be eaten, or I will be I will be even more severely violated. Right? That's the that's the expansion of being eaten. I think what you're saying is, while we might experience as anger coming from the mind, it's much more than that. It's actually an experience of the body. And and if we think it's just in the mind, and all we need to do is control it, we might be a little off in how we're trying to deal with it. That's right. And while there are parts, right, like everything is connected, every emotion is connected to a particular faculty of being, meaning that, you know, we have three faculties, the body, the head and the heart, and they're all interrelated. They all function in a in a very interrelated way. But the body is the first layer of uh, what you call interaction with the world. And the body is also, it's it's simultaneously letting things in and also acting as protection. So guess what happens when you feel like you have to protect? Your body jumps into reaction. Now that's why anger is actually most viscerally felt in the physical body. Although when we really explore, go down the anger tunnel, we will see that the origins of anger is you know, some form of violation and a deeper experience of shame, guilt, other complex emotions that are in the heart, but most vividly felt on the level of the body is anger. It You can actually like literally feel it in your, your heart starts to race. Um, there is almost a surge of, there is a knot in the stomach, there is a surge of energy that starts to come. And it's all very quick, but physically you can experience it. And at a certain time, and I am no stranger to this, uh, there is a feeling that this energy needs to be released in some way. I have done it before, but I have knocked my hand against a wall or really banged at a table because that's the only way to actually release the energy because the energy has nowhere to go. So you started off by sharing that anger comes from some sort of violation. What do we feel is violated? What What's usually going on there when we experience that violation? So violation has, a, again, a bunch of emotions associated with it. One experience of violation 
is just survival, right? Like I've been violated and I'll be killed, right? That's on the most, I would say, gross level. So I have to fight back. So there is there is rage. That's on one level. And then when you take it from the most gross to the most subtle level, on the subtler levels, violation happens because in some way, I feel I have been shamed, that I have lost control, that I am helpless in response to something that's been done to me. And all of those trigger uh, greater and greater degrees of feeling violated. Yeah, that last one around helplessness, that resonates a lot. And it can be, even within since that's on the more subtle side, there can be gross feelings of helplessness where somebody's doing something to me or to somebody else and I feel completely powerless to stop it and I know that it needs to be stopped. Or it can be much more subtle where like I'm upset with my kids because they're not listening to me and we've had this discussion so many times and nothing I do seems to work. And now I'm getting upset with them. But underneath that is really this feeling of helplessness that my parenting is not working. The things that I'm trying to do is not, I'm not getting the intended effect. And I'm also not having the influence that I would have wanted to to have. Right. Absolutely. The other uh, universal, I think, universal feeling around the spirit of violation is some sense of unfairness. Every expression of anger that I have encountered either on the receiving end or on the giving end i've seen is accompanied by a sense of this is not fair right and when we talk about violation violation ultimately is a violation of something uh, something that i held sacred as a as a contract as hey this is fair and that fairness that sense of fairness has just suddenly been disrupted which is why I experience anger not just because something was done to me, but I can also be angry when I see something being done to somebody else. That's a very common experience of anger too. Now it is it may be connected to me, but it may it may be something that I have deemed as sacred for myself, but I see that somebody else it's being violated for somebody else. And that also creates a sense of anger. Yeah, so this this concept of fairness is tricky <laughs> because <laughs> there's some pretty concrete and black and white of like what's fair and what's not fair. And then there's like a small child who had one lollipop and wants a second one and says, you know, mommy, you're not giving me the second one. That's not fair. <laughs> there's yeah, there's yeah. big differences in that. I mean, anger can occur from both of them, but how should we think about those two? Uh, this is where this is where it gets very complicated because and this this that is why when we talk about these emotions it's very hard to talk about them without actually on a baseline level talking about what is the level of consciousness of someone and we talk about levels of consciousness as being our, the core of our work and the idea of how we describe human consciousness as a grayscale as a as a spectrum where on the healthier side of the levels, there is just a a much greater degree of awareness of reality. And as we go down the levels of consciousness, that degree of awareness dramatically reduces. So when we talk about the sense of fairness, it's interesting that everybody on the spectrum of consciousness experiences (laughs) fairness in a very different way. Which is why the the freer we are from uh, the shackles of our own ego identities, the the more healthier we are on the spectrum of consciousness, the more closer we are to what can be deemed as more objectively fair and reasonable. And the further we fall, it doesn't mean that the sense of fairness, the sense of fairness is still felt. But what we will see is that as we go down the levels of consciousness, the sense of fairness is very skewed. As a simple example, I can say that someone who actually feels very entitled, the level of consciousness is 
pretty low because someone who feels entitled feels like the world has to has to cater to my needs. You can see that there is a skewed sense of reality. Even when the world is catering to someone's needs, they feel like this is not enough. That's the feeling when you're facing somebody or when you're with somebody who feels very entitled. Now, are they feeling that things are not fair? Yes. <laughs> but is that truly in touch with reality um, or reason? Probably not. And it's tricky because <laughs> part of being at a lower level of consciousness is not having that awareness. <laughs> and yeah. so, I mean, sometimes we have this that we're saying, oh, it's not fair. And we we kind of know that that's not really objectively true. But a lot of the times we legitimately think <laughs> that things are not fair, but that feeling of unfairness is really coming from the ego rather than any sort of objective measure. Yes. And uh, in certain in certain cases, uh, the feeling of unfairness can be, it's completely understandable. Like, for example, I work very, very hard through the day. So to provide for my family. And when I go home, my partner tells me, God, you never have time for me. <laughs> the, the immediate experience is I'm doing so much here. That, that is the most relatable example. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy, right? Like, and, you know, while that may, and I didn't mean to do this, that may, you know, I don't want to get into gender stereotyping, but, you know, it's something that most men will say they can actually very strongly relate to. I can also see the other side where, you know, when women work so hard, it's like the same experience happens where, you know, why don't you do more of this? Or how come you cannot manage everything, right? Like, and it just, it just feels like this is just not fair. <laughs> yeah, actually, in my relationship, I think my wife feels more of that, that she's working so hard. <laughs> and actually, I'm wondering why she doesn't have more time for me. And, and she feels it's unfair, like she's working so hard on stuff that's really important for our family. And then she needs some alone time, actually, she needs time to compress and be by herself. And so if I recognized, if I appreciated how hard she was working, then I wouldn't be asking for that time. And neither one of us is right or wrong. There's there's obviously certain needs that are not being met, negotiations that need to be have around those needs, but it's a real experience on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason why I choose this experience specifically is because it's somewhere in between. Like, and when I say somewhere in between, this is not feeling necessarily entitled. But at the same time, this is also not in the highest spectrum of consciousness. It's a it's it's daily experience. We and we can't say that that experience of anger is incorrect. Yeah, it feels unfair because you've been working so hard, and then that just doesn't feel enough. You feel helpless <laughs> in that situation. And what is violated here is a sense of self in that relationship, where. The other person has just brought down your sense of self by saying you're just not giving enough to the relationship. So it's painful. And you do feel very violated. Again, it's very understandable by that, where that feeling comes from. The question in this case that we have to ask ourselves is, okay, how should we deal with the anger or the sense of unfairness that arises in this specific situation? Now, what is unfair here? And how is that unfairness experienced? And uh, that's when you start entering the subjective territory. How is one person experiencing something versus another person experiencing something else? We have to come to a to alignment in that understanding. That's the only way you can actually truly resolve <laughs> that situation. Yeah, and and as you're talking, and and you mentioned before about things like shame or helplessness, and it can be some of both in a situation like this it's like on one hand i actually might have a either a deep sense or a not so like a more conscious sense that i'm actually not doing enough in this relationship and so anytime the person brings it up it's like you're reminding me of something i already know but i don't want you to remind me of it and so now i'm actually angry at you 
for reminding me of this shortcoming, quote unquote, shortcoming that I have. And then on the other hand, the helplessness is like, I hear you expressing a need, but I don't know how to meet your need or I'm not very good at it, or like, I'm too busy myself, or I just don't have the the spaciousness in my life to be able to do that for you. And that's so painful. But rather than experiencing the discomfort and low feeling that's associated with that helplessness, the anger can feel more seductive. And that's why we call the last episode, the seduction of anger, it can feel more seductive And so I go for that rather than wallowing in that other less energizing stuff. Yeah, to your point about when somebody questions, I'm already beating myself up and then somebody reminds me. It just increases my feeling of helplessness in that situation. Now, what also anger does, and this is a very uh, uh, subtle thing to understand, anger always hides a deeper sadness. And uh, there can be a sadness of loss. There can be a sadness around helplessness. And anger becomes the emotion that sort of blocks stepping into a deeper sense of sadness or grief, whatever that might be. So as an example, (laughs) take the case where I have a definition of what being a good partner feels like. And I know deep down, I'm not meeting it. And then somebody reminds me, the sense of helplessness just increases dramatically. But what I'm actually sad about is the definition that I've had for myself. I've not yet come to terms with it, that either my capacity or my circumstances don't let me actually live up to it. And so it takes some real acknowledgement of where the gap is, where the limits are actually coming from, and sometimes it either experience a loss or a feeling of sadness. Oh my, like, I feel really sad that I'm not able to live up to it. But anger steps in <laughs> even before we can actually let ourselves feel the sadness of it. I know that example was a theoretical example that you shared just now. Um, <laughs> not, so I, <laughs> not so Okay, well, <laughs> I, I, I want to mute out yourself rather than me to out you. <laughs> Definitely um, not. <laughs> um, so in this example, I found myself rooting for, for you or this theoretical person. There's such an opportunity for growth there because there's humility that's possible. It's like, yeah, I can't live up to this definition, which I've wanted to shoot for. And I'm, I'm where I'm at. And if I can get to a place where actually that's okay. And I still might have that goal of being better and hopefully you do, but like if we can offer ourselves some self-acceptance and some self-empathy about where I'm at and really cultivate that humility, it's an incredible growth opportunity. Yeah, truly, Um, which is why going back to where we started, an emotion exists for a reason. Anger is pointing to something deeper. And when we give ourselves the space to explore what that is, sometimes it can be circumstantial sadness. Sometimes there is existential sadness that we find. I work with clients who are in the space of, you know, reform and change and and are really very actively working, lead big organizations that are wanting to change the state of a nation. And it can feel very hopeless, but there is a lot of anger but underneath the anger, there's a sense of sadness and a, and a loss of what they really stand for. The sacredness, the purity of intent. And when you can really touch, and the anger masks the sadness for some reason. The sadness, the reason for why I can let myself feel the sadness is because it makes me feel very vulnerable. But at the same time, if I don't step into it and really look at what I'm actually sad about, I can never rise above it. I can truly not come out on the other side. And this is where unresolved anger lives. <laughs> and the challenge with unresolved anger is it just becomes a part of my character, unfortunately. Right? When, when you say anger versus being an angry person, those are two different things. Everybody experiences anger. 
but we become an angry person then we real live for a long time with unresolved anger it starts to actually just permeate our being because deep down behind that anger there's some sadness that i have really not looked at how do i know if i'm living with unresolved anger disproportionate responses <laughs> many times i respond very strongly to things that do require responses but they are disproportionate right and so it, it's important to really look at why was that disproportionate why did that come the way it did the other thing is just in a way of being you can experience that with someone who's i'm just angry at the world and when you are with someone like that you just feel like even stepping into the presence of the person you i just want to eliminate humanity <laughs> in some way uh, because i'm so angry and that is actually again it's an extreme but it's also a very big clue that there is unresolved anger uh, the other way that uh, unresolved anger shows up is i get triggered even when the person the other person didn't intend to trigger me i get triggered by either the presence of the person or something that the person said where the person actually didn't intend to cause any harm and so my anger comes at the person but what i have to look at is what did this actually touch when something is a straw that broke the camel's back it means that there was a bunch of stuff behind it that i'm reacting to and not just the thing that happened most recently yeah yeah uh, and so if you follow the lead and many times we need help we definitely need help we need help of uh, a coach a therapist or somebody else who has the skills and the the love and the care to go uh, go to those places with us where we can then unpack it and start to resolve it yeah this stuff takes courage i mean it it's hard to ask for help and support for anything but especially going back to what i shared in the opening and then you shared in response to that because we see anger as a bad emotion or bad people are angry and bad things happen when i'm angry asking for support and help on this particular topic can be can be extra difficult and so personally when i see it when when people come to me to talk about this particular topic i feel like an extra dose of admiration and awe for those people because it is um it takes something it takes a lot absolutely yeah and usually there are three ways in which i see that we don't necessarily healthily deal with anger um the first way is outburst an outburst is never a, a healthy expression of anger um uh, it usually is disproportionate and it also takes a toll both on the self and the other person right the second form of unhealthy dealing with anger is ignorance i just don't even acknowledge that i'm angry right uh, the third is i know i'm angry but i'm not supposed to be angry there is almost a fear that if i acknowledge my anger then i'll be an angry person right that leads to not acknowledging my anger but knowing that i have anger then the other way of is just suppressing anger it's like oh yeah i'm getting angry but you know what i'm just going to keep it within myself because otherwise i'll not be a good person and so what does that look like as an external expression it will be all right i i just don't want to talk right now okay i'll just do what you want <laughs> yeah so there can be some sarcasm and it's clear that resentment is there and it's more like a simmering it's like you have a pot that has a cover on it and the water's boiling and the top is not popping off but the water's just like seeping out and keeps seeping out and seep and it's like somebody's got to turn off this pot or <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean eventually it does it does leak and it will burn someone right and and burn the self too so um it's important to uh, just pay attention to any of these three patterns yeah and the people who go to anger management are usually or the people we think that need to go to anger management are usually the people who have the first one that you're talking about the outburst yeah. yeah because uh, because the the kind of damage that's done 
through an outburst is just enormous. The, the remaining two are somehow you can escape without having to deal with it. Right. And one's not better than the other, but in some ways the other two can be more toxic because it's like, I can go my whole life. I can go to my grave, never having looked at this or dealt with it because it never actually caused a huge amount of damage in a concentrated way. But instead it was just this toxic presence my, ent my entire life. You know, so we talked about simmering anger, right? And then there's another form of anger. So you have hot anger, you're simmering anger, then you have cold anger, right? It's and cold anger is pretty, it's pretty cold. <laughs> It's like, well, I'm going to I'm going to torture the person by not really saying anything. I'm just going to like erase this person from my life. I won't do anything to the person, but I'm just going to like cut the person off, even without the person knowing that I've actually cut this person off. All of those are also not very healthy ways of dealing with anger. So we talked a little bit about getting support and getting help. What else if we're working just with ourselves? What else might we do if we realize that actually anger is something we need to, to work on in our life? Well, the first thing is looking at anger not as a negative emotion, but as an emotion that exists for a reason and it's pointing to something. There we can actually ac accept that we are angry and look at the reason behind the anger rather than just expressing the anger because anger, the reason why anger is so dangerous is because it's not, many times the expression of anger is not rational. When it comes to the level, and we talked about how anger lives in the body, um, we say things, we do things, we throw things that are, we don't necessarily give thought to the consequences of, you know, the actions that are caused by an unhealthy expression of anger. So once we acknowledge anger, it, it creates the pause between the stimulus and the response. It creates the space between the stimulus and the response, which is for anger especially is extremely important. And that space <laughs> then affords us to think about, okay, so how should I respond at this time? And the response may very well be, hey, I'm feeling very angry right now, and I'm not in the space to actually be able to think rationally. That's why they say before you hit the send button, read the email, sleep over it, read the email again. It's creating that, that space, right? And that is perfectly fine. Um, at least from a point of view of outcome, you've prevented more damage. But then what it also does is now that it has prevented further damage and then you having to spend energy to deal with the outcome of your anger, of your unhealthy expression of anger, you can then step back and really start looking at, well, what led to it in the first place? To anchor that, you've given us three, three steps there. The first is to understand that anger exists for a reason, which can help in our acceptance of the fact that we are angry and not making us right or wrong for experiencing that, but it just is at that point. And then the second thing is to look at the reason behind it. So is it helplessness? Is it shame? Is it some sort of fear? And it might be a combination of all of those things or, or other emotions might be at play there. So trying to, to determine what's at the root here and, and maybe the anger is more of a symptom of some other emotion. And then finally, creating that space, as you said, and thinking about what might be if I give myself some space and some of those physical feelings that surge subsides, then what do I want to do with it? What's actually the most beneficial way to respond at that point? That's right. Anger is signaling that something needs to change so, or something needs to stop, right? And there is a very constructive purpose for it. If we only understood very clearly what it's really aiming at and respond accordingly. So let's use that force, that energy in a very constructive way because otherwise anger would be wasted. It's a lot of energy that's actually wasted in, in an outcome that then becomes even more hard to repair. 
Yeah, it's almost always counterproductive when we have one of those three responses that you outlined earlier. It, it almost always drives us further from the goal. So if we understand what our goal actually is, like if what I'm wanting is more support from my partner or more connection or more intimacy, I don't think <laughs> anger's and, and, and angry outburst is not going to help me get any of those goals. So with a little bit of space and some processing and understanding what those needs might be, I can actually brainstorm with my partner or maybe with myself to figure out what would be the most constructive ways to get those needs met. Now here is, I don't want to, you know, this is not meant to be dark, but this is something that is very important to keep in mind. That even when we are engaging from a place of rationality, we may find that the other person is refusing to engage with us or the other person is just not in the place capacity wise or desire wise to give us the understanding that we are really looking for at its core at its i would say you know at its most refined we do experience anger when we feel so not understood for how much how hard we are trying to resolve <laughs> like hey, i'm doing i'm angry i'm talking about it i'm trying to resolve it but like there is just no engagement or willingness sometimes to really understand and that can also make us angry then there is a there is a loss of hope and in those circumstances it's very 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 important that we get help we actually ask for help from someone who's outside of the situation because what we need at that point is understanding and the person that we are seeking the understanding from is not in the place to give it to us uh, i just i just got goosebumps when you said that because um that's so true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say except that is that is so true. And uh, sometimes all that we need is understanding of how hard we are trying, and the person that we need it from the most is just in, just not in the place to be able to give it. So we will have to get it from someone else or somewhere else, so that we don't go to the unhealthy side of anger. Thank you for sharing that. That is a huge contribution to me personally, and I'm hoping to to everyone that's listening. It's only by suffering that we that I have learned certain things, <laughs> and this is definitely one of them. And you also are that person as a coach that people come to who are needing that understanding. And I need it too. Uh, it's like I was talking to Vipin today morning in the other podcast on our relationship with validation uh, that we do have to create a chain of healthy mirroring in our life because without that chain, and when I say chain, a system that's only as healthy as uh, when everybody in the system can actually really provide that for each other. So there is work to be done in building a very healthy chain of support structure. And just to revisit what you shared, just because somebody else is not able to give us that understanding doesn't mean they're wrong. So it also informs how we treat them. It's just that they're not able to, for whatever the reason is. And so it's our responsibility to to get that understanding from that's right. That's right. another from... source. From another source yeah. and it doesn't maybe necessarily feel the same way as getting understanding from this person but it can go a long way even if we if we get 70 percent of what we need we are much better off than just not getting anything beautiful so as we come to a close any any final takeaways that you'd want to share i think we have shared a lot and if anyone has any questions or uh, anything personal that you want to talk about, please feel free to reach to us, reach out to us, or write to us. We really want to hear from you, our audience. Um, we want to engage with you. So please write to us. Amazing. And uh, thank you, Razanath, for sharing your personal reflections, sharing your own stories, and um, for your incredible wisdom, and also for always offering me personally, both through these conversations and in our own private conversations, that space of understanding and receiving me in all the ways that I need to be received. 
doing my best to serve. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for listening to Upbuilding the Self. Upbuild is a leadership development company that offers workshops, coaching, and other services to help you on the path towards being your best self, free from the shackles of the ego. To learn more about our work, visit our website, upbuild.com, and sign up for our newsletter to gain access to podcasts, reflections, and upcoming events. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes to leave us a review so that others can find and benefit from the podcast. We look forward to being with you again next time.